it is my pleasure to introduce Ian Fraser. Thank you very much, for Michael, for that very kind introduction. I believe my job today is to see what we can learn from one successful public health campaign that included a vaccine that might be relevant to COVID-19. It will be no surprise that my message will be that it will probably take longer, cost more, and achieve less than we would all like, but we will get there in the end. Cervical cancer is a global challenge. We lose 330,000 women to cervical cancer every year, mostly in the developing world. And this is a disease which is still in the developing world increasing in frequency. The history of the attempt to control cervical cancer goes back to Georges Papanicolaou, who came up with a screening test for cervical cancer. It was first described in 1928, where he looked at cells from the neck of the womb under the microscope and saw cancer cells and realized that this might be a potential way of diagnosing cervical cancer. He finally published the work in 1943, uh, so it took quite a while for the message to start getting out there. But perhaps the most significant thing is that it wasn't really until there was a plan for national screening introduced that the ben benefit of this new test to help prevent cervical cancer was evident until about 1987 in the United Kingdom where these data are from, cervical cancer and frequency did not diminish, even although a, pro a, pro a program of screening had been mooted and introduced. It was only when coverage was reached by a national call recall program that the, there was a sufficient level of coverage that the number of deaths from cervical start cancer started to fall. The real breakthrough with cervical cancer, however, came with the recognition by Harold Surhausen and his colleagues that this was a disease caused by a virus infection. He, Professor Surhausen, initially speculated based on the knowledge that he had from papillomavirus causing disease in animals, that it was possible that cervical cancer, which was mapped as a disease that was transmitted through sexual activity, might be due to a papillomavirus. And it was his colleagues, and particularly Lutz Gissmann and uh, uh, Hans Eichenberg, that went on to show that there was actually papillomavirus DNA in cervical cancer tissue using the then new technique of DNA measurement through southern blotting. And that set the scene for controlling cervical cancer as an infectious disease, rather than as merely a, one amongst many cancers. The reality was that treating HPV infections themselves was and remains a challenge. The only effective means that we have to treat HPV infection is to destroy the tissue that contains the infection rather as this gentleman is suggesting that you do with a shotgun. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, 550 people on Facebook recommend this, although in times of Trump, perhaps that's not so unusual now to see Facebook recommendations for things which aren't quite effective. Preventing the infection, nevertheless, would seem much more sensible than trying to treat it, given that only destructive treatment is available. That became possible because of Harold Surhausen's observ observations in the 1980s. And uh, his observation was that there were at least four viruses that might be involved of the papillomavirus family in causing cervical cancer. What he didn't know and what we subsequently learned was, of course, that these infections were very common. So it was important that we understood the natural history of the disease to make it sensible decision about how public health measures could be used to control it. The data on the screen here show that uh, the, uh, from if you look at a group of college students in time zero in the graph in the middle there is when the college students had entered college and test them regularly for HPV-16, which is the highest risk human papillomavirus, then there's a linear increase in infection rate such that after three years, half of all of the population that were screened clear of the virus when they came to college had acquired HPV-16. Of course, the good news from the practical point of view is that if you look at the graph on the right hand side and time zero is then 100% of a group of people infected, then over the course of five years, 98% of those people will clear the infection themselves without ever knowing that they've had it. 
Nevertheless, this is a common infection, and there are two common HPV types associated with cervical cancer and several rarer types, such that it takes about eight or 10 different types to cover more than 95% of cervical cancer. And as I say, most of these infections resolve spontaneously. And unfortunately, one to 2% will progress to cancer over a period of between five and 25 years with a median of about 15 years. Unexpectedly, it's possible to detect the precancer changes that Papa Nicola have described as early as one to two years after infection. So there's a long time before the precancer cells turn into cancer. This gentleman is, uh, is my late colleague, Dr. Jan Zhu, and he and I together uh, worked on developing a vaccine to help prevent cervical cancer. Uh, that became possible because of a new technology that was available at that time using eukaryotic gene expression systems to express the major capsid protein of the virus in the laboratory. This was necessary because it's not possible to grow papillomavirus in the lab. You can only isolate it from tissue and therefore it was necessary to use a synthetic papillomavirus protein in order to help protect by vaccination. These virus-like particles self-assembled if we'd got the conditions right for making them, and they were highly immunogenic, which was, then became the basis of the vaccine. So that we took uh, material to make the vaccine from a clinical lesion and cloned uh, and isolated li live virus and extracted the genetic information from the virus, and they cloned the major capsid gene in a eukaryotic expression system. This was necessary because if you expressed it in bacteria, you got a protein which resembled the L1, but was not immunogenic and didn't produce an immune response that was host protective. The virus-like particle purification was a challenge which we undertook on very small scale, but industry had to deal with in large scale. And that was one of the reasons why the development of the vaccine took so long, because getting from the teaspoonful of vaccine material that we could produce in the lab to the much larger quantity needed to develop a vaccine program globally it took several years. Nevertheless, it became possible and the vaccine bit was based on these virus-like particles and an alum adjuvant. About it. it was in that sense a very conventional vaccine with a very conventional adjuvant and protein. And that became the basis of the vaccine being tested through clinical trials. It's worth pointing out that there was a patented technology involved in that, which was very important for persuading the vaccine companies to take the vaccine not uh, challenge on, because uh, if that had not been a patented process, that may be very unlikely that they would have invested the $2 billion that it took to drive the program from 1991, when we came up with the technology, through to 2006, when the vaccine got launched. So that the patenting, the patented technology was based on the eukaryotic expression system and a couple of genetic uh, observations, which made it unlikely that you would have got to a vaccine by any means other than the way that we chose to do. That, of course, is all public domain information. The virus-like particle technology has been widely used since then for developing vaccines. We did the work back in 1991, and I suspect we're probably one of the first groups to use uh, make virus-like particles. But when I looked in Medline recently, there was something over 200 publications every year for vaccine development using virus-like particle technology. We didn't probably do the make the vaccine in the most efficient way. As I say, it was necessary for the companies to take other ways to do it. We used a vaccine expression system originally and then a baculovirus expression system. Others found better ways of making particles uh, using yeast and using insects, uh, insect cells to express the proteins. And these people contributed very significantly to the development of the vaccine technologies that led to the vaccines we now have to prevent cervical cancer. So that this was a story which spread itself out over 25 years, including quite a large amount of work done by industry. And I recognize particularly Catherine Jansen and Ned Skolnick at Merck, who put a great deal of effort into turning what was our research project into their development project and eventually into doing the clinical trials. The most important part of the observations was that the that these virus like particles work by producing antibody, a very conventional way of providing protection against infection, and that the protection was long lasting and safe. The, to prove that required very large clinical trials, because as I pointed out, only one to 2% of people who get this infection will go on to develop uh, even a precancer, let alone cancer. 
And so the trials that were done initially involved tens of thousands of people and they were randomized placebo controlled trials, of course. And the end point that was chosen for these trials was the disease that has to be treated if you find it, which is cervical precancer, CIN23. And with that endpoint, of course, we only expected to find one to two percent of the 10,000 women that would develop the disease in the placebo recipient group. And the vaccines turned out to be 100 percent or near 100 percent effective, which I can, must confess was a surprise, but a very pleasant one when we got the data back. But there are two uh, caveats on that. One is that the vaccine only worked in HPV naive subject. If they'd already had the infection, then there was no evidence that it helped prevent disease. And also that the vaccines only protected against the types of HPV that were present in the vaccine. So that we, as I mentioned, know that there are at least 10 papillomavirus associated with uh, cervical cancer. And uh, the, the original vaccines just had two types, types 16 and 18, and then two types that cause genital warts, type six and 11. The vaccines we now have use nine different HPV types and give about 95% coverage. The original vaccines used just the two and gave about 70% coverage against cervical cancer. And there was, of course, resistance to their use. In fact, there was a whole industry grew up in trying to convince the world at large that these vaccines were neither, neither effective nor safe. And uh, that, that, in fact, continues to this day, although I have to say very much, very much less now than was the case back in 2006. In the time after the vaccine was launched in 2007 in Australia, and we were one of the first countries in Australia to adopt it, the first evidence that this vaccine was working in the field as opposed to in clinical trials was the very dramatic reduction in genital warts that occurred amongst the uh, women under the age of 21 who had, were vaccinated in, the, in 2007. And by 2011, genital warts in young women had virtually disappeared. And this was a a very significant immediate effect of the vaccination and it meant that for the, these diseases virtually disappeared from a sexually transmitted disease clinic. Of course, the woman over 30 who hadn't been vaccinated, there was no change in the prevalence of genital warts. The interesting thing from the practical point of view was that the, gen the genital warts also disappeared in the unvaccinated male partners. So that from 2007 on, again, there was a very dramatic reduction in genital warts amongst men under the age of 21, although they had not been vaccinated because the, the herd immunity effect kicked in and reduced the risk that these, these men would actually get genital warts. One thing that we learned confirmed fairly quickly after the vaccines were introduced was that they, these vaccines were not therapeutic. If the vaccines were given to you, young women under the age of 14 who had not been sexually active, then they got good protection against cervical precancer, about 75%, which bearing in mind that these were women vaccinated with HPV 16 and 18, and therefore only protected against 75% of cervical cancer. There was seven, at least 75% protection against cervical precancer in the woman immunized at the age of 18, of 14. But if you look at the woman immunized at the age of 17, where there had been considerable prior exposure to the virus, then there was a much lesser reduction in the instance of cervical precancer, indicating that those women who had already been infected were not protected against the disease progressing onto cervical precancer. So we need, need something for those women who are already infected, and that's indeed something that my research work is pursuing to this day. But the major challenge was getting this virus where it was needed. There was a major disparity between the initial vaccine programs that were rolled out back in 2007 to 2010, which the countries were shown in green on this map, and where the major burden of cervical cancer was, where the purple circles are. And that this was really uh, an indication that we weren't getting the vaccine most of where it would be most effective. We did a project in Vanuatu, which is a near neighbor country of Australia with a, a problem of uh, many developing world countries that it doesn't have a particularly organized health system. Uh, Vanuatu has about a quarter of a million people spread over 50 islands, about two hours flying time northeast of Brisbane, where I live. And they only have 25 doctors where there's 250,000 people. They have 91 parliamentarians, all male. And that was uh, one, of, one of the reasons why it was a, a bit of a challenge to get the vaccine introduced there. 
And they had the usual problems with vaccine delivery that they had only one vaccine fridge for all the 50 islands and no reliable electricity. If, if the power went off, then diesel generators were available, but the diesel was never there to run them because it was for going for other purposes. At any rate, we uh, went out and surveyed in Vanuatu and found that there were amongst 500 well women and over 30 in uh, Port Vila, the capital city, five of those women had cervical cancer when we screened them and another 17 had cervical pre-cancer, which puts the instance of cervical cancer in Van Vanuatu amongst one of the highest globally. So we introduced a vaccine program and while I'm shown there in the picture was actually delivering it, in fact, of course, the program was delivered by the Nivanu people themselves. Uh, the program depended very much on a process of education and that was done by the Nivanu district nurses who went to the schools and educated both the children and their parents about what the vaccine was about before the program was introduced. So that there was already a wide amount of knowledge about both cervical cancer and the vaccine and its safety before any vaccine programs were started. As a consequence of that, we were able to achieve quite a good coverage with the vaccine in Vanuatu. And uh, comparing Australia, where we immunized 12 to 18 year olds with a knocked out program and managed to get 90% coverage for the first dose of vaccine and about 86% for all three. In Vanuatu, and we immunized 10 to 12 year olds in schools with a knocked out program and got about 80% coverage amongst the girls in the, in the first two years of the program with about 98% return for a second dose and 93% for a third. So we were able to show quite convincingly that uh, uh, given the free vaccine, it was quite possible for Vanuatu to deliver the vaccine programs effectively in Port Vila. And then we went on to demonstrate that they could also be delivered effectively in the other islands. And at the moment, they're covering about half of the population of Vanuatu between 10 and 12 each year with a vaccination program paid for largely by UNICEF and in part by charitable donations. Bhutan taught us another lesson. This Bhutan, the program there was sponsored uh, by, by uh, Merck and uh, they provided vaccine and uh, delivered by the Australian Cervical Cancer Foundation, an Australian based charity. We went across there to meet up with the royal grandmother, who is this small lady with the pink scarf sandwich between my wife and myself in that picture. She had decided that uh, since India was uh, offering a vaccine program to some young woman and, and Bhutan, she wanted to have healthy women. She would arrange for a vaccine program if we could find the vaccine. And she just told the two gentlemen in the saffron robes, the Minister for Education and the Minister for Health, that uh, a program was to be delivered. She was the royal grandmother and her law was, her word was basically law in that country. And they delivered a vaccine program very effectively there. Uh, th this is a picture of the vaccine being blessed by the priests before it was being delivered to the community. Note this is a fairly recent picture because they're all wearing face masks in times of COVID. But what we actually observed there was that the the first year that the program was delivered, there was an estimated 6,700 children that were eligible for vaccination being between the ages of 10 and 12. And 100% uh, approximately of those uh, were to, if successfully immunated on a schools-based program. The government then realized that it was actually quite hard work reaching all the schools. There are very few roads in, Van in uh, Bhutan. And uh, so they, encouraged girls rather to come to health centers which were mostly on the roads and quite a long way away from the villages and then immediately there was a significant drop off in the vaccination rate fell to about 60 percent of the eligible girls and that continued until the program returned to being a school space program in 2014 and again the vaccine rate was much more successful after that so the moral to the tale there is try and keep the program schools based the challenge that we face, however, is to get the vaccine where it's needed. And while it's nice to do develop, uh, a demonstration projects in countries like Vanuatu and Bhutan, where there is a great need for vaccination and where there is a willingness in the community to have the vaccine, it's worth looking to see how we're actually doing on a global basis. Over the last uh, 20, 15 years now, we've delivered over 300 million doses of vaccine worldwide. Now, if that big orange box represents those 300 million doses and the 25 million people alive today who will die of an HPV-induced cancer, uh, 
then the theoretical benefit from the vaccine delivered will be 3 million lives saved of one in 100 people will get cervical cancer uh, in their lifetime. And therefore, we, are, we should, in theory, have saved 3 million lives by the 300 million doses of vaccine. But the reality, when you get down to the nitty gritty of it, is that the likely practical benefit will be nearer 10,000 to avoid a cancer, because almost all of the vaccine to date has been delivered in countries in the developed world where there are already very effective screening programs to help prevent cervical cancer. And therefore, the benefit, the additional benefit of vaccination is actually quite small. That's obviously something that we need to rectify. One of the challenges that we face is that this vaccine was originally developed to be a vaccine that was given three times. And it's kind of a traditional thing about vaccines that you give three doses of vaccine. But it wasn't immediately clear that that was necessary. And after some early studies, it was shown that at least in under, for children under the age of 16, two doses was as effective as three. But two doses still requires a, a, a program where you keep records and where you note who's been vaccinated and who hasn't been. And one of the uh, benefits, if you like, of doing big campaign programs is that not everybody who take part in a trial will necessarily get three doses of vaccine. And when they went back and analyzed the data from one of the original uh, vaccine programs in the developing world where uh, uh, the intent was to give three doses of vaccine, they found that while three doses of vaccine was very effective at preventing infection with papillomavirus after five years, there was only a few percent of patients that got infected with HPV-16. When it came to looking at two doses and one doses, they turned out to be equally efficacious, although the numbers, of course, were small because these were women who uh, didn't actually receive all three doses. It wasn't a deliberate attempt to give two or one doses. It was just that there were some people who could be followed up but only got one dose. So that one, maybe one dose would be effective. And that would, of course, mean that you could do campaign immunization rather than program immunization and just go through and immunize as, as, a, as a matter of a campaign once and try and get as many girls as would be eligible. So the big challenge for HPV vaccines these days, first of all, what age to immunize because it has to be given before sexual activity. And in Vanuatu, that means before the age of 10 years, whereas in Australia, you can be reasonably comfortable with immunizing at the age of 14. Where to immunize? Well, school space programs work in Australia and they work in Bhutan and they work in Vanuatu and they don't work so well if you then try and do them elsewhere. So it seems logical to have a school based program. How many doses? Well, probably one dose might be sufficient, but it would perhaps break transmission cycle, but two doses is the proven, the proven efficacious number of doses. And then the question is whether we need to introduce the nine valent vaccine globally because it's more expensive than the two and four valent vaccines which cover HPV 16 and 18. And the answer, as I'll show you in a minute, is that we probably do need to use the nine valent vaccine because of the significant part of, of the burden of cervical cancer that can be attributed to the other virus types. Do we need to immunize only girls or should we be immunizing boys as well? Well, boys get cancers caused by papillomavirus, uh, they get genital cancers, although not nearly as frequently as girls will go on to get cervical cancer, but they also get oropharyngeal cancers. And at least in Australia, oropharyngeal cancer caused by papillomavirus is now more common than cervical cancer caused by papillomavirus. And it's a disease which is mostly a disease of men. And then, of course, there are men who have sex with men and can catch the infection that way. So it seems better to introduce a universal program. And on top of that, you then get the benefit that nobody asks why you're only immunizing girls and are worried about there being some unexpected uh, mes message about perhaps causing sterility or whatever. So given the efficacy of herd immunity, maybe single dose mass immunization would be the most cost effective across the globe. So the World Health Organization is now talking about cervical cancer eradication and the aim of the exercise is to try and achieve that within the 21st century. Uh, in Australia, we're targeted to get our rate of cervical cancer down to a level where it becomes a rare disease, four cases per 100,000 women per year by 2020 or 2025. Uh, that will probably not work globally, but, uh, they, but if we manage to introduce both screening and vaccination, it's estimated that it should be possible to eradicate cervical cancer on a global basis by the end of the 21st century. But we do need to include the other HPV types in there because the blue, the red line shows what will happen if we do both the 
uh, the HPV 16 vaccine and screening, uh, but only if you use the nine valent vaccine from now. And the blue line shows what happened if you only vaccinate because you'll lose all the women, the protection of the women who have already got HPV infection. So it's important that we cover all the bases with the program screening uh, through uh, HPV detection and cervical precancer detection and nine valent vaccination. So I'll just finish with a thought in comparing poliovirus and papillomavirus. Poliovirus, like papillomavirus, in lifetime risk of catching the infection is about 50%. Uh, this is pre-vaccine, of course. The lifetime risk of getting paralytic polio was about 1%, uh, and the lifetime risk of death given infection without intervention was about 0.1%. Whereas for HPV infection, about 2% of women will get a serious disease sur surgery to prevent cervical cancer. And 0.8% uh, will die of cervical cancer. If, not, if there's no vaccine program. In 1952 in the United States, which was the last pandemic of poliovirus before the introduction of the poliovirus vaccine, 3,100 uh, people died of paralytic polio and about another 22,000 were left with mild to disabling paralysis. In 2005 in the United States, which was the last year before the papillomavirus vaccine was introduced, 3,900 women died of cervical cancer and 12,000 were diagnosed with cervical cancer. And that in a country that was already, at least in principle, offering screening to help prevent cervical cancer. So that clearly cervical cancer in 2005 was a worse disease than polio was in 1952. And in 1952, people were queuing up to get the poliovirus vaccine. So you would hope that in 2000, uh, 2021, people will be queuing up to get the papillomavirus vaccine. Both vaccines are very effective, at least 97% effective for the papillomavirus. And the safety of the vaccines have been shown over a very long period of time to be very safe indeed in the papillomavirus vaccine with less than one in a million severe allergic reactions and no other significant side effects is indeed a safe vaccine. So that I'll leave you with the message that basically we should be aiming for worldwide routine vaccination against HPV infection to reduce this huge burden of cervical cancer, the 300,000 women who die every year of the now unavoidable disease. And at that point I will stop and thank you very much for your attention and hopefully can return this screen sharing back to the centre.